Thank you, and uh, welcome to the meeting. Um, I'm here tonight to really talk about a little bit what I did um, back in my teaching days at Happy Hot Bog High um, with students that I had. Uh, I started teaching in 1969, um, and in 1970, uh, I read the 1970 census, which I'm sure all of you have read by now. Um, and I was amazed to find that 70% uh, of the population of this nation is born and dies within a hundred mile radius of their place of birth. And I said, that's, that's silly because wherever you're born, we're all moving to Florida <clears throat> and that's where we're gonna die. So that's absolutely impossible. And then I, I realized I was born in Jamaica, Queens. I grew up in Hicksville. And then I was teaching in Hot Bog. I had moved 50 miles and with declining enrollment, I was gonna die here. So uh, that sort of dazzled and amazed me. And I knew really, very little about the place where I was born um, and where I lived and where I taught. And I said, you know, that's a shame. I should really do something about it. I, I should ask, how many of you here are, have been born, well, obviously it goes without saying, uh, had, were born and now live within a hundred mile radius of where you were born? See, every once in a while, the government does actually a fairly good job. And then, you're looking around and this group is sort of a exemplary of that fact. Um, so I started looking at Long Island from a, um, a guy who wanted to be very proud of the place in which I was born and where I lived and where I taught. And then I looked at a map and I said, how am I gonna convince people that Long Island is really important? Can you see it? Kind of tough on that map of North America. And by the way, I'm using two computers and I'm computer illiterate, so watch this right now. <laughs> Any better? Zeroing in on the United States. There's the United States. That's where we're, the country in which we live. And there's Long Island, I think. This is a lot better. It's color coded for me because my eyes are going. Um, you can see Long Island is sort of in pink. There's New York sort of blanking out there, which is really nice. Uh, but I want you to take a look at Long Island, then I want you to take a look at Montana, because I'm going to come back to Montana later on. Everybody, oh, let me see if I've got my. Uh, for those of you who haven't left the island, Montana's up here. Okay, so um, I began my research, again, looking at Long Island from a, from a number of uh, facets. Sometimes old maps, I like this one only because of the fact that it broke up Long Island very, very nice, nicely. And we are exist in the Atlantic. The student was in my class and ended Atlantic with a K. No one noticed that? Okay, you gotta move, you gotta move forward, that's the. Uh, and obviously Long Island is Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk County. Now I know most of you, when you think about it, they say Long Island is Nassau and Suffolk. That's why when I was asking a, a student who was in my class, I asked the young lady, I said, where's the East River? If we're looking at this being part of New York City. She said, the East River's right here. I said, why is the East River there? Well, you said it. That's part of the city. And I know when I go into the city, I go under a river. So it's got to be right there. That's amazing. Now, you remember, I'm out here in Hoppo. So uh, there a group of 16-year-olds who are getting this whole education here are gonna come with really basic understandings of what the island is. Aerial view, now there's no breaks. That is Long Island. From Brooklyn out to Montauk Point, about 120 miles. Working here, about 120 miles from Brooklyn to Montauk Point. Where's Long Island City? Queen, bravo, bravo. So you already know that people who think of Long Island, geographically, it's Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk, not just Nassau and Suffolk. I was amazed in 1987, uh, Money Magazine, which I'm sure you've all read by now, uh, were listing the best places to live in the country. And I'm just going through this, and I'm saying that's sort of amazing that they're listing the best places to live in the country. And Believe it or not, Long Island was sixth. And I said, you gotta be kidding. Long Island can't be, this is a national magazine 
with no obviously preconceived notions and are equating Long Island based on all other places in the country. And I will tell you, they took taxes into consideration. Uh, their evaluation was interesting. Uh, they took a peek at education. They said our educational values and our educational performance was par excellence. Uh, they also noted that we had 19 colleges in Nassau and Suffolk. Now I'm telling you that they dealt with it as Nassau and Suffolk, but I found this list to be kind of odd. Nashville, all right, Norwalk, Connecticut, Beaver County, Pennsylvania, Danbury, Long Island. You gotta be kidding. That's like going through colors, green, blue, purple, 42. You can't stick Long Island, Nassau and Suffolk is gonna be equated with Danbury, Connecticut and Boston's North Shore. That is one heck of a way to sort of evaluate Long Island is to include Nassau and Suffolk as one little place. It's not a town. So ultimately on down the line, I found that to be relatively interesting. But they, again, they listed taxes that said yes, but for the standard of living that you get on Long Island, we, we were rated very, very high. And of course, education. Then they said climate. Climate, really? What's the last time we had a real bad hurricane? Yeah, Sandy, what's the one before that? Gloria, 1985. If you've got those two things down, when's the last time Florida had a hurricane? Last week. <laughs> they rip through there all the time. When's the last time you, Dorothy, and Toto headed for a tornado ship? No, you don't. And it's rare. When it, and by the way, there are tornadoes on Long Island. They have been here. But they are rare indeed. How was your winter? Only on Long Island, when it snows, do you go, eh, do I shovel or wait for it to melt? Uh, it's not really a big issue. Up where I fish, up in Eagle Bay, New York, up north of Utica, they can get four feet of snow in one snowfall. We don't really worry about it that much. And when it gets cold, or it's 40, before we wear a sweater, uh, what's hot? 75. 75, yes. Well, it, when, how many times does it get to 90 on the island? You, it's a rare occasion when you get up to 90. Most of the time, the weather, when you go outside, is it, when you equate it based on other places. I know it sounds odd. I was in, a, and again, I'm a typical Long Island, right? and I haven't moved very much. So when I got west of Philadelphia, I started teaching in 69. I got west of Philadelphia in 1977. Uh, and I went to different places and I would always relate to them based on what was happening here. Uh, and I would always relate to it based on what was happening on Long Island. And I got to Arizona, I said, oh, they have such a wonderful temperature here, the average temperature. It's like 75, and I'm asking this woman, she goes, yes, it's like 130 in the summertime, and it's 30 all during the winter, and it does average out to this nice temperature, but it's not comfortable. Well, I thought this was, you know, Arizona, you know, right after Florida, everybody's moving to Arizona. She said, no, and I said, but it's dry heat. That's what I said to her. I said, it's dry heat. Her answer to me was, my oven is dry, but it's not comfortable to live in the oven. <laughs> I know. One for Long Island. That's good. I like that. that was a good... And she was from Massapequa. You can imagine it's the woman I was talking to. And she said, you know, I'm thinking about taking my kids back to see uh, the grandparents of uh, this fall. Can you tell me, do the leaves still change in fall? <laughs> I said, I didn't look last year, but I, I think they did. Here she was in Arizona. And there wasn't the type of thing that she remembered, the seasons that went from the spring to the summer to the fall to the winter. So I, I'm sort of, you know, thinking this is going to be pretty neat. Again, one of the things they rated here also was uh, recreation. They listed restaurants. Hey, restaurants? You've got to be kidding. Yes. When you go out to places west of Philadelphia, if the town has a restaurant, that's where you eat. Upstate in Eagle Bay, we have two restaurants. If you don't like those two, you're gonna drive 40 miles to the next place. It's just not gonna work. Uh, 
And people don't think of that. They don't think of that. When you say on Long Island, let's go out to eat, what's the next thing you say? What are we going to go for? Italian? You're going to go to Chinese? I go Greek. There's a new Thai place right down the road. We could go. Out west of Philadelphia, you go to the local place that's there, the diner. That's it. You know, we don't think of it that. But that's exactly how it works. Um, amazingly enough, as you sort of take a look, again, at climate and education and recreation, health. If you get injured on Long Island, where do you go? Where do you go from Brentwood? Southside. Southside. How far is it? Six miles. I remember first child, wife goes into labor, and I said to call the doctor. He said, Well, what, what, how far are the, the tracks to the park? Should I time these? Time? Yes. When there is such and such a part, head to the hospital. Because the hospital where I was in Smithtown was St. Charles, or indeed, Smithtown General, St. Catharines of Siena, pick one. Which, which one carries your insurance and go? They're all within a short, short run. I never thought of it that way. If you have a serious problem, we hit New York City. Um, hospitals were one of the things that they rated. I'm upstate New York in the place I mentioned to you, Eagle Bay, New York, and I'm online in a food store in Eagle Bay. We haven't been there, they haven't really lived. I'm online and the guy in front of me is buying something and he's talking to the cashier and he says to the cashier, or the cashier says to him, do you want to go fishing tomorrow? And he says, no, I can't. My wife is due. We have to go down to Utica and get a motel. Being the classic guy I am, I said, I'm from Long Island. We usually get the motel before you get pregnant. <laughs> Donna afterwards, and they both looked at me as you know, who's this jerk? You know, standing here, you know, who timed his wife initially down to so he could be 10 minutes away from the hospital. And he says, No, he said, when you do, the closest hospital is Utica, New York, 60 miles away. We have to drive down, get a motel, and wait till the contraction. I'm going, holy crap. I said, you know, this is an area where you do a lot of logging. What happens up here, you know, in a logging accident where someone gets injured and without, he's, well, we died. <laughs> Again, Long Island moved very quickly up on my ladder of places to live. Um, and if you take a peek at uh, housing prices, we, why are they so high? And you're very happy about that. Usually when they go up, rarely do you go down. Uh, in Pennsylvania, you found towns that absolutely died. Rarely does that happen on Long Island. After that pandemic, the east end of Long Island, absolutely zooey as far as property. And people were buying them. So it must be a place where they want to live. And it probably is schools and its way of life. It's interesting. And it's how we view it. A fellow I knew that was leaving Grumman, he lived in Merrick, and, uh, and he was going to Florida. And he said, uh, yeah, I'm going to Florida. I want to, want to get out of Long Island. So I said, would you mind if I came over and I just interviewed you about, you know, why you're leaving and so on and so forth. So I went to meet him and I said, what's the thing? Well, I just can't, I, I want to golf. And uh, I want to go to Florida, I want to golf. Whenever I want to golf, that's fine. My wife, she wants to go out. She wants to pick peaches. She wants to pick lemons and oranges off the trees, backyard. You know, we want to just get rid of, you know, we just want to get rid of the winners. These are the things that we were looking for. Uh, it'll be a place where my grandkids can come down and visit. I said, oh, wrote all this down, wants to golf. Wife wants to pick lemons and oranges. I said, good. Uh, about a year and three months later, I'm driving through the same neighborhood and he's mowing the lawn on his house. So I stopped and I said, you didn't leave? And he goes, go away. No, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Call me at another time. I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking to you now. Go away. And I said, gee, wow, that was kind of rude and crude. Uh, but I waited and went back. And I said, did you, did you go to Florida? He said, yes. You're back? Yes. I have my list here of all the things that you left. You didn't like, well, you didn't like the logo bills. I left that out. Local bills were so high. So I said, you wanted to golf. 
He said, Flora is so hot that I have to get out at five in the morning for me to get in. I'm 75 years old. I can't. I can't golf when it's 110. So I golf more up here than I golf down in Florida. So well, your wife wanted to go pick the orange and lemons. Yeah, when the snakes moved across the lawn, that was the end of the oranges and the lemons. So I'm sort of trying not to smile and laugh at this day two game as we're sort of going through this. And I said, well, you know, that you wanted you know, a place where you drink it. Frank has never been. I mean, gosh, I mean, I come down once. That's all I did, come down once. I said, well, how did you end up getting back here? I mean, you know, I, the guy I sold it to was indeed working for Sperry's. It's very shifted. So I was able to buy my house back. I paid $10,000 more in one year. I was in my own house. But I did get a couple of pieces of furniture that I left with him. I said, well, you said the Luco bills were high. You know what the water bills are in Florida? The water bills are just this bad. So I'm kind of trying to go all this stuff down again, trying not to laugh. I said, what did you miss most about Long Island? And this was interesting. I missed my doctors and I missed my restaurants. In that order, doctors and then immediately restaurants. And I thought that was interesting to have a guy who was telling me he wanted to leave Long Island instantaneously and go to a better place because it was fine down there and found out that Long Island wasn't that bad. You know, even with the bills and everything, he comes back and buys the same house back just to be able to stay in the same place and go to his restaurants and see the same doctors. So again, health-wise, believe it or not, Long Island ranked very, very high. It's interesting in the, in the article, they also talked about uh, language. You know that they consider Long Island to have our own dialect. Yeah. Only when you go to some other place, they have a funny accent. They think we do too. <laughs> we change R's to A's. As your brother, want a glass of water? It's not water. It's not brother. Water with an A. You just we tend to do this all the time, and they think we have this funny accent. And I'm always. Amazed, and they also think we talk too fast. No matter when, when I went cross country in 1977, and I would ask, I said, Do you have the directions to get there to make it? I guess directions, yeah. sure. Go down the road, you'll see a four, you'll be all right. And all that. You got to tell me today, you got to get this, you got to be able to do this. And, and immediately when I talk to the guys, are, are you on drugs? Because you're talking very, very fast. You know, that was, I'm saying to myself, I can't be that odd at this stage of the game. But to many individuals, I was the odd one. Uh, and it's hard to realize that as you sort of go through that we are relatively unique. We're unique in how we act. We're unique in how we respond to things. Long Islanders are a unique group of characters. And we, uh, we're going to include Brooklyn, even though they have a worse accent than we do. I know that it's sort of regional, but it's only 120 miles. Uh, again, when you go out to uh, Suffolk County, you might notice every once in a while, it has more of a New England twang to it. If you really listen very carefully, uh, out on the East End, they do have a little bit of pack the cat in the back of the garage uh, type of routine. So you have to be conscious of Uh, in 1992, uh, we dropped. We went to 122, so it didn't take that long. But again, I always had problems. And I wrote Funny Magazine. I said, you really can't do this. You can't say Abilene, Texas, Athens, Georgia, Indianapolis, Long Island. It do that doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the category. If you're going to say North Shore of Nassau County, or Washington, Manhattan, or something like that, or South Shore or Fire Island. You know, those are the things that you have to deal with. But we were still in the top 300 in 1992. U.S. population, last census, 2020. Uh, 329, 329,500,000. 329, which is larger, Nassau or Suffolk? Raise your hand if you think it's Nassau. This is where you have to be committed. This is like going on a parade on Memorial Day. Get committed. Three people say Nassau. No, no, a larger, I'm sorry, in population. I'm sorry, I should have said it. I'm so embarrassed. If I screw up, just tell me. 
in population, which is larger than Nassau or Suffolk? How many people say Nassau? How many people say Suffolk? How many people really don't care and have never been concerned about it? <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that very much. I'll see you at the end of the uh, Don't plug anything in or anything out. No one. Suffolk County is larger than Nassau County in population. That's current population 1.3 million, Suffolk County 1.5. Suffolk County is three times larger than Nassau County. What do you have to be concerned about? Suffolk County has had three times that population that you're looking at. Uh, and I am concerned about that only for water quality. Um, the Pine Barrens is a treasure trove of water. And believe it or not, the 2.8 million people that exist in Nassau and Suffolk get all of its water from underneath them. This is the only place on the planet, not the United States, not North America, the only place on the planet where 2.8 billion people get all of its water from underneath. I want you to think about that when we're talking about dumping garbage or recycling on down the line, because I think that's going to be our gas prices are going to be minuscule in our history. Uh, if we don't start concerning ourselves about water, because I don't want to be on the end of the water line going through New York City, heading out to Nassau and Suffolk County. That's not a place to go. So if Nassau and Suffolk County got together and started buying land in great amounts, I think that would be a good plan for them long term. That's why I'm avoided a political gap. If Nassau and Suffolk County became a state, state of confusion. <laughs> uh, how big would we be among all of the states? Near the top, near the middle, near the bottom. Up there, zeroing in on a very precise or up there. We're, uh, we, have, we have more than a last. We would be the 29th largest state in the union. There are only 21 states that have more, uh, more population, that, am I doing that right? 29th largest state, there are only 21 states that have more population than Long Island. We would be the 29th, we would be the 29th largest state. Remember I showed you that one on Montana? Suffolk County has more people than the state of Montana. Mr. Ballone and his concerns for water and energy and all the things that he's involved with is greater than the governor of Montana. And most people on Long Island don't realize that you have value. If we were to break away from New York, New York would drop from like the second largest state to about the fourth. And that's an interesting point to look at. Now, of course, will New York State ever let Long Island go? No. Nassau and Suffolk County produces 40% of the tax revenue for New York State. And when you put the whole, hey, that's, that's not too bad. 40%, we're doing, we're doing a good job, yeah. And all the roads upstate are being paid really with a lot of dollars that are coming from Long Island. Um, and then, computer one, computer one, I have lift off. I told you this was gonna be a, an experiment in terror. Did, did I plug comments? I didn't touch it, no, that touched me. very good. <laughs> What's the uh, population in geographic Long Island? Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk. That's that satellite view that I gave you, and even the one that said Atlantic with a K. Eight million. If Long Island was a state, where would we be in relationship to the 50 states in the union? Go ahead, up there, go ahead, <laughs> up there. We'd be the 13th largest state in the union. The 13th largest state in the union. So from Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk, man, all of a sudden now you're, there's a level of importance that you should be gaining here. We do, we do matter. Uh, Abraham Lincoln once said that a, that a man, and if he 
had to do it today, he would say men and women should be proud of the place in which they live. And I think that's a good state. I think that's a one that I would buy into. Um, and the fact that Long Island has people that want to stay here, they find that because of climate and health and education and recreation. And you don't think of recreation. We grew up on Long Island, and as I saw the hands go up before, we grew up knowing you go and get yourself beaten to death at Jones Beach in the waves, or basically go up to the Sound and go swimming there very nicely. It's tougher to chase girls on the North Shore because it's rocky. I found it easier to chase girls on the South Shore where it's sand. Obviously, this doesn't go over big with the majority of the people here. <laughs> but I found that I grew up doing that. I grew up, I grew up fishing, I grew up clamming. Um, I remember as a kid taking the bus from Hicksville down to Jones Beach, walking along the wharf and watching this guy take a picture. He's on the thing, he's taking, and I'm looking, what the heck is he taking a picture of? There's no boat, there's, there's no plane going by, there's nobody surfing. So being the character I was, I said, what are you taking a picture of? He goes, the ocean. The ocean? Where are you from? Kansas. <laughs> oh, yeah. You haven't seen the ocean. And you look at a map of the United States, how many people from Oklahoma, Kansas have never made it to? And we make choices instantaneously. You know, we can go to Lake Rock Concord if you don't like salt water, swim in freshwater down the slide, deal with the Indian princess who's inhabiting the, inhabiting the lake. Population geographic Long Island, and if we were a state, we also, these are the ones now California, Texas, Florida, Pennsylvania, New York would fall from second to fourth without Long Island's population. Illinois, Ohio, Georgia, North Carolina. Michigan, New Jersey, and Virginia. And we just missed, we just are a little bit behind Virginia, but those are the only states that beat us. By the way, we have a greater population than Switzerland, Denmark, Finland, Norway. And I was, and when I thought of that, I don't know whether anybody watched the Winter Olympics. Norway was winning all of these winter medals, and I'm going, What's the matter when they are on Why don't we get up there? We have more about, you know, they have nine people that I think they ski out of the womb. And, uh, and, and I realize we have more people, you know, in our, in our little counties than they have in their own country, but they do whatever they do very, very well. Uh, Libya, Estonia, Ireland, there are more women on Long Island than there are people in Ireland. Lebanon, just want to include all the geographic areas. Nicaragua, Aswana, and Croatia. I remember in, during the Reagan administration, uh, we invaded uh, Grenada. I don't know whether everybody remembers that. I'm playing too much history with you all. Uh, but I found that to be unique because when we sent our military, our Marines and the Army and the Navy, and the Air Force to indeed take back Grenada, we were invading Hicksville and Levittown. <laughs> Grenada has the population of Hicksville and Lebanon. Billy Joel's. You're invading Billy Joel's territory. <laughs> That's kind of goofy when you think of it. The numbers just sort of don't match up. We have great numbers. When um, you start to think of all the things that we could probably deal with and talk about, I decided rather than make a, um, a list for you, I would just give you a list. And hopefully you're able to make it out of there. Wyand Dance and Heather Flower, Giovanna de Valenzano, and Jefferson and Madison and Blizzard of 88. Is there anything up there that, now this is gonna take a little logistics because I've got two computers and one doesn't have numbers and one does. So I may be going back and forth and you may see me manage for a bit, but is there anything up there that gives you that you have the foggiest idea what it's about? Oh, yell it out. Goody Garlic. Goody Garlic. Uh, Goody Garlic, watch carefully. Oh. Well, I'll see if I can do this. Goody Garlic is... Should be able to get it real quick here. Goody Garlic 
uh, was a woman from East Hampton who, believe it or not, in 1657 was charged with witchcraft. You think it's only happening in Salem. That's not the case. 1657, Judy Garland was charged with witchcraft uh, by a woman named Howell. She said that she had looked at her infant child and he died. Gee, I thought this lecture was going quite well. <laughs> so the, um, they, they brought her to trial. Now, for witchcraft, um, they said, that, by the way, she also had an evil eye. Now, I know my mother did. My mother could look at me and think evil things happen, but I don't think that Goody Garland, and by the way, that's a sort of a phrase for good wife, Elizabeth Gork. Um, she was brought to trial so seriously that they dragged her over to Connecticut. At this stage of the game, by the way, uh, 1657, Suffolk County was part of Connecticut. Some people may not know that, but it was part of Connecticut. She was brought over to Connecticut for trial and Governor John Winthrop presided over the trial. She was charged with witch witchcraft. She was found not guilty of the charges. They didn't have enough to prove that she was sent back to East Hampton, a hated and despised woman. But believe it or not, as I told you that she had actually, she was given a house on Gardner's Island uh, where she lived out the remainder of her life with her husband. That's not the only witchcraft trial. Mary Wright in Oyster Bay and her husband were charged with witchcraft in 1660. Uh, they were banished from Oyster Bay, but closer. Uh, there was also uh, Ralph and Mary Hall from Setauket who were charged with witchcraft. Uh, they got so much uh, sort of bad mouthing type of from the community uh, that they picked up and just left Setauket. Setauket. Most people don't know that the history of Long Island sort of fits into a lot of the sort of the parallels that's happening across the country, but it's not only Salem, Massachusetts, uh, it's Long Island as well. Now I gotta go back to that picture. Here we go. Anything else that sort of rings a bell or doesn't ring a bell? Austin, 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 uh, Austin Corbin. Watch Carol. Austin Corbin was the first president of the Long Island Railroad. Um, tell me something you know about the Long Island Railroad. It's never on time. It's never on time. Long Island Railroad is the third oldest operating railroad in the nation, 1844. It actually went from New York City out through Hicksville and then all the way out to Greenport, where you were going to get a ferry and take the ferry over indeed to New London and then Boston. The Long Island Railroad was built to get people from New York to Boston. And Austin Corbin was the first president. Uh, again, I think we're, we lose to the b &O Railroad, which I think is ahead of us, but there's only one other. And then the Long Island Railroad is the third oldest, which will come as no surprise to anybody who's written the Long Island Railroad because the seats are miserable. Why this then? Why all these? You can never get on the Long Island Railroad to this. Can't do that. And if you've ever noticed, the Long Island Railroad has an engine in the front and an engine in the back. That's because they do this. Yeah, that, that's all they do. These, after they built the road from New York City to Boston, initially they did not think they'd be able to get over all of the creeks and rivers in Connecticut. And then they came up with steel rather than iron. The old bridges, all made out of iron, would have collapsed on the way. But the new steel bridges, which came through, allowed them to sort of um, traverse those rivers and get from New York to Boston very easily. So this original run that you have here out to Greenport was not, not needed. No one's gonna get on that and then take a go across the Long Island Sound. Of course, that had been the, there were a number of wrecks that are occurring in the Long Island Sound at this stage of the game. So that didn't sort of, sort of prod anybody on to do the uh, crossing by boat. But then all of a sudden they said, well, if you want a railroad line, just tell us. That's why this one goes to Port Jeff and dead ends. This one goes to Oyster Bay and dead ends. This one indeed goes out to Montauk Point, dead ends. I used to travel my, in my college years, again, never, never having left Long Island. 
I used to travel from Hicksville uh, out to Stony Brook. And I, I can tell you, and it was always Sunday night, I'd leave my house in Hicksville, get out the last train heading out uh, to the East End to get back to my room. And some guy with tie askew was it, anybody, how many more stops to Riverhead? You're on the wrong train. And I knew this was the last run and they were gonna stop the train. That's where it was gonna be for the whole night. It's not gonna start till tomorrow morning. So this guy's gonna have to get from Port Jefferson all the way to meet out to Riverhead. And that wasn't happening that night. And it happened more than once. And I always thought that that was kind of odd on down the line. The Long Island Railroad would build a line to anybody who raised their hand. Brentwood has its existence because very good. Josiah Warren decided to take advantage. They decided to sell land across the Long Island Railroad lines. And Josiah Warren, who was a follower of Stephen Owen, uh, sort of one of the utopian socialists of the time period, decided to buy a mountain of land and try and create one of his utopian socialist communities here, modern times. So we owe our existence in Brentwood to, in fact, the Long Island Railroad, who allowed Josiah Warren to come in here and have no government and no laws, and all the things. I mean, if you, I'm sure all of you have read about it. Uh, you know, nudity was allowed. I mean, you think about today, when we're talking about smoking Mattery Joanna, uh, and uh, and allowing that to take place, and you find people on both sides of that argument, that would have been totally permissible in modern times. Two women came into town and they're all together. It's okay. There were no locks sold in the town. Uh, there was no police because obviously there's no one who could be arrested for anything they did. There was no money. So ultimately on down the line, you dealt with labor guns. Uh, I just find that to be incredibly interesting. What, one of the things that I thought was amazing is that it was a peddler going through modern times and he lost his gold pocket watch. Uh, and in the middle of modern times, there was a post where they used to hang all the notes that people wanted if you wanted uh, help with the farm or you were looking for labor. And somebody came up and hung the gold pocket watch uh, on the post. And the, the peddler coming back weeks later comes through modern times and there is this watch hanging on the post. And he says, my, this is my watch. And the person says, well, you probably lost it. Yeah, but my gold pocket watch is hanging on the post. Well, I was blowing it, but you're, you're kidding. So you just left it hanging out? Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't belong there. But this guy becomes the great prophet for modern times. There are people that are so honest. You know, they'll leave your gold pocket watch hanging up for you to find. And by the way, there are two nude women who are coming into town hourly. You know, so there were a whole load of things ultimately on down the line that were all of a sudden modern times had a different look. Uh, there are no laws, there are no police. Uh, and that survived until about, I think it was 1864, I think was the name change. The Civil War uh, created a lot of problems as far as the passing of money and currency. And so Josiah Warren will try one more time, I think in Canada, uh, for his utopian socialist community. And of course, that modern times becomes Fred Wood. Getting a, just getting flashes of history. Oh, I'll give you another one on this one. All right, I'll give you one. Who? Jupiter Ham. Jupiter Ham. Okay, good. I think I can find it relatively quick. Uh, Jupiter Hammond was the a slave of the Lloyd family uh, in Huntington. He was the first. Jupiter Hammond was a slave of the Lloyd family in Huntington, and he is the first published black poet in America. Now, I grew up um, being told that it was Phyllis Wheatley who was the first published black poet, but I can tell you that he predates her uh, in publication. Now, I will tell you also that the Lloyd family published his poetry, mostly religious in nature, uh, but they found also letters uh, of him uh, at, up at Yale, in the Yale Library, um, and Jupiter Hammond is there. Uh, as an aside, uh, I had a student of mine go to Cornell, um, and uh, he had, I had had him in Long Island history. Um, and he says, the professor said, no, it's Phyllis Wheat. There's no doubt about that, it's Phyllis Wheat. He said, no, my, my teacher in high school, you know, back on Long Island said it's Jupiter Hammond. 
He said, no, unless you can prove that. I'll tell you what, if you can prove it, it'll give you an A. So obviously this guy got on the line instantaneously, wrote me a nice letter and said, just send me your data on that. And I said, oh, sure. I did that, set the whole stuff up. And the professor then wrote me a note. He said, this is the first time I've ever lost that bet. But Jupiter Hammond, the first published black poet in America. So you end up with a, a, a black history also. You probably saw um, uh, Sojourner Truth go by there very, very quickly. Uh, Sojourner Truth marched from New York City out 25A to Huntington. Uh, uh, she was a runaway slave, took her daughter, ran away in 1833, uh, and was one of the individuals who led the effort to sort of create the Underground Railroad. Uh, and she was here on Long Island uh, in 18, 1838. Uh, so there is a Black history here on Long Island, by the way, that's incredible. Uh, there now, uh, there's a wonderful museum out in Southampton now that's uh, trying to preserve the, uh, the house of uh, Philip Concert who was a sailor who was aboard the ship to Manhattan uh, when they went to Japan. Now, again, this is sort of an odd routine, uh, but again, I grew up thinking that it was Matthew Perry who opened Japan, uh, and that's not the case. The first person to get to Japan uh, was the, the, the ship, the Manhattan, sailed by a fellow by the name of Mercantile Cooper, uh, who was out from Sag Harbor. Uh, and Mercantile Cooper found uh, 23 shipwrecked Japanese sailors on an atoll in the middle of the Pacific. Now, at this stage of the game, um, Japan was closed to Westerners. Japan had closed the doors. The Dutch were out. The French were out. Everybody was out. But he just was not going to let that happen. He sails, sails into Yokohama with these 23 uh, shipwrecked sailors uh, and deposits them on shore. On board his ship was Phyllis Consor. And the, that was the first African-American that they had ever seen in Japan uh, and to play the game, which I'm sure you know, they kind of rubbed him, figuring this color would come off. Uh, it didn't, um, but he was part of that expedition. And it was the maps that Mercantile Cooper made from Sag Harbor that, that Commodore Matthew Perry used when he opened Japan years later. So uh, you have this sort of continuum and now they're in the process of trying to rebuild uh, Concert's house out in, because uh, he, he came back to Long Island and stayed here. Uh, he was actually a slave initially and became free in 1833. So he's an interesting character. So he sort of fits into uh, the Black history on Long Island as well, uh, along with the first published Black poet, uh, Jupiter Hammond. Um, I'll finish that up with Booker T. Washington, who you probably remember as Tuskegee Institute, uh, Tuskegee Airmen during World War II. Uh, Booker D. Washington was the first Black American invited to the White House uh, by our good old guy. If you have to have this as a note, this is it, Theodore Roosevelt invites Booker D. Washington to the White House. Uh, Booker D. Washington lived uh, for eight years up in Fort Salonga. I found a telephone book with his name and his phone number. You could call. Uh, amazingly enough, uh, I did not know that Booker D. Washington was here at that stage of the game, but he was. Uh, and for a period of time uh, was a Long Islander. I find that uh, pretty neat. I'm watching your face, how much time? Come on, let me know. A little bit more. That's the journey too. Yeah. I'll stop it. Schmidt Town. You got it. That's the bull. The bull whisper. Added Whisper got his name. Whisper got his name in an elementary school contest in 1911 to pick the bull that supposedly found in Smith. <clears throat> Mr. Smith indeed was supposed to get on the bull and ride around Smith Town and all the land that he could circumnavigate in one day could be his. It's almost 66 miles. You buy on this now? because the Indians didn't believe. He had gotten the land, believe it or not, from Lion Gardner uh, through a deed that he had gotten from uh, the great chief of the Montauk Indians, um, Lion Dance, who later became a high school on Long Island. I didn't know where to um, So believe it or not, he decides now he has to deal with the Indians. And so the Indians agreed that he got on his ball. He could all the land they could circumnavigate he would get as hit. So supposedly he waits until the longest day of the year, smart guy, June 21st, 
and then rides his bowl around the area that will become Smith Town. You gotta be kidding. I can't walk for a leukemia walkathon more than five miles unless I'm walking with the ice cream truck, you know, <laughs> as we're going along to make it all the way through. Um, he's on a bowl running through the woods. Bulls are not known for speed, um, but supposedly he said, I'm gonna get on my bowl and show you where my land is. I honestly believe that's just a lovely fantasy. And plus, you don't name your farm animals. Hi, what are we having tonight? We're having Ralph. <laughs> Ralph, we're having Ralph's behind corner. You, you didn't, that's what I learned from my own. You don't name your farm animals. <laughs> Just and this is Shirley the chicken. We'll be having her tomorrow. You know, ultimately on the online didn't work. So the name Whisper, I ended up only finding after 1911. And some lovely woman told me that that was how they got it. It was an elementary school got it. Uh, but this sort of follows true with all the other things that my mother used to say. There were terms. I'm going to get on my bull, and you're going to make a strong statement. There used to be in the European theater when the pap when the papacy wanted to delineate uh, districts for religious churches, they issued a papal bull, which was a strong statement on theology or on geography where certain parishes would be. So to get on your bull, I think, was just making a statement. It's sort of like my mother's, boy, that'll blow your socks off. When's the last time you saw anybody, their socks being blown off? But, or my father's, yeah, when pigs fly. You make these statements, but they're not. Yeah, really? The pigs are, they must be running very fast to get into the air. You know, ultimately on that line, there's like, we, we use these statements a lot of times with, again, sort of very little thinking about what they're really meaning. I will do one more. I'll give you a new list. Okay, so uh, yes, that's a new list. It could be, give me 34 seconds. Do, 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 do. See something you want me to say? Talk. About Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, Albert, one of my favorite characters. Um, Albert Einstein, uh, as you know, was uh, an individual who escaped Nazi Germany in the 1930s and came to New Jersey, Princeton. Uh, but most people don't know. I'm going to go very quick now. There he is. There's uh, Albert. Uh, Albert, indeed, uh, when he, the summertime came, he left Princeton um, and came to Kutchuk uh, out on the East End of Long Island, which is where he spent the majority of his time in the 1930s and actually all the way through the 1960s. Oh. I think it's just pulling up. Uh, died in. What did I say? 19? Oh, I'm so embarrassed. Not 1966, 1956. Uh, but he lived all the way at that time, all the way out on the east end of Long Island. Uh, and he was sort of the classic character. Uh, he had a good friend who he met out there uh, by the name of David Rothman. David Rothman had a pharmacy uh, kicking out in Kachov. And in the first year, he came out to uh, the east end. Uh, he went into uh, Mr. Rothman's uh, store and asked uh, if he could buy some sundial. And Rothman looked at it again and said, I want to buy a sundial. So Rothman took it out in the back of his shop and showed him a sundial that he said was not for sale, but he would loan Mr. Albert Einstein his sundial if he wanted it. He goes, no, I want sundial. <laughs> oh, sandals. Um, and so, believe it or not, Rothman sells him a pair of number nine women <laughs> sandals. And uh, Einstein was pretty odd about his dressing code. I don't know whether you're aware of it, but he had 11 outfits that were all the same. Same shirt, same jacket, same pants. He said he couldn't be bothered getting up in the morning and deciding what to wear. So therefore, and it, his brain worked differently than, than mine. Um, and so I found it to be that, an interesting guy. Uh, that's his house still standing uh, in Kutchuk. 
out on Nassau Point section. If anybody knows where that is, great place for fishing. Does anybody get out of the right one? Come on now, just <laughs> uh, we just go to Ellen's stuff and then we, we go home at the <laughs> parade and then we meet with the chamber of commerce. <laughs> This is a, a great story. Albert Einstein was a great sailor. And I will sort of end with this one. I'm teaching a motions course for teachers in an effort to try and get them to include more Long Island material in what they were teaching. Whether it was history or English, you could still talk about Long Island authors. If it was art, you could talk about uh, all the authors that are here, William Merritt Chase, everywhere on Thomas Moran, you could go on and on and on. Uh, and so uh, in the middle of the uh, lecture, and I'm talking about Albert Einstein coming here, and I, and I also mentioned that in 1939, uh, there were two individuals from Princeton who found out that the Germans were uh, beginning heavy water research, uh, which meant that they were looking to produce an atomic bomb and they thought that was kind of dangerous. So they figured that the only one who could convince FDR uh, to begin work in research uh, was Albert Einstein, who actually was probably the theoretical physicist at the time. So uh, Leo Suzard and Eugene Wegner uh, left uh, Princeton in a 1936 Buick, which they rented. Again, not critically important, but I've got to get that out of my brain every once in a while, otherwise it hangs around there. Um, and they drove out to Patchogue because they couldn't find Patchogue on the back, and they figured Patchogue must be close to Patchogue. <laughs> not even close. So they had to stay over and then drive out to Patchogue and show. Uh, Einstein, all of the information that they got, it, and he was convinced at that stage of the game that he had to write the letter to FDR. Um, and so he did, wrote a letter to FDR urging him to begin at least the research on the atomic bomb. He will regret it later on, but it was the letter that was sent by Albert Einstein from Kachok in 1939 that began us on that sort of journey in atomic energy. Now, that being said, as I tell this to the class, uh, a gentleman raises his hand and said, you know, I've got a story about Albert Einstein. You might want to, I don't know. I said, sure, I'll take anything. I love firsthand stories. He said, I used to deliver newspapers. And he said, I love the summer because we would get a whole load of summer residents who would come out. And so my subscription rate would go up and I'd be able to deal with all these papers. He said, but I'm out there and I'm going by the Potomac Bay. And he says, I see this wiry white head man, you know, or this man with wiry white hair, sailing and reading at the same time. And he said, the boom is going over his head and he's ducking. So he said, what an idiot. You know, this guy's reading and sailing and he's paddling with his feet. He said, I got my papers in the fall. He said, it's the beginning of my route. And he said, sure enough, boom, the sailboat goes over. The guy's flailing in the water. And uh, he uh, puts his papers down, takes over shirt, dives in the water goes out, helps the man write the boat, puts the man in the water and says to him, boy, mister, you must be awful stupid to try and read and sail at the same time. He said, I had this nice letter from Albert Einstein thanking me for the rescue. He brought it in. I said, you have got to be kidding. You say Albert Einstein? <laughs> he goes, yeah. Uh, and he wasn't even on my route. <laughs> But I thought that was, could you imagine life being changed by Albert Einstein dying in the Pecanic Bay at that stage of the game? Well, anyway, that's, it, it, it's amazing the characters that you'll find uh, on Long Island. Uh, men and women of all statues from obviously the earliest of times, whether you want to talk about Henry Hudson in 1609, he, no one will get credit until uh, the Pilgrims land in 1620. But you've got Veronzano in 1524. He doesn't get credit because he's, a, he's Italian sailing for the French. Adrian Block is not going to get any credit, even though he's the first one to map Long Island in 1614, long before 1620. We sort of fall into that. But Long Island has played a role again in exploration all the way up to the present. Even today, we're still doing work. And you can talk about Grumman and Sperry's and a few of the others. Uh, but we have played an important role in not only the, the population numbers, uh, but in our impact on American history. So as Lincoln once said, uh, a man and a woman should be very proud of the place in which they live. Uh, and you should sort of walk out of here head held a little bit higher knowing that you're a Long Islander that has such a great history. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it.